The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, the chosen one seeks the grail, and the deleted one gets the hammer. A bujold stock tip you can run with, plus we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky, all right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Editor Tony Daniel. We have part two of a two-part interview with David Weber and five members of the BU9 Honorverse Consulting Group. These include Tom Pope, Chris Weave, Mark Guttis, Stephen Ryder, and Arius Kaufman. All of them were in our studio here at Bain, and we had a great time doing this one with them. It's a lot of fun, and you can listen to part one in last week's podcast. It seems every time we have David on the podcast, it turns into a two-part show. Strange. We also continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. Now the news. So, a reminder, the e-arc for the new Lois Bujold, Borkosigan saga novel, Gentleman Joel and the Red Queen, is available at bayneebooks.com. And e-arc is an electronic advanced reading copy what we used to call the galleys, complete with glorious typos. And here's a little insider info for you. Lois turns in very clean final manuscripts, and the copy edit and proofreading are fairly minimal on this one. So you are pretty much getting the final book with the Gentleman Joel e-book, e-arc. But you're getting it three months early, of course. And another insider tip voices in my head this morning that claimed to be St. Michael, St. Catherine, and St. Margaret told me that now would be a good time to go to Orleans and break the English siege. Well, they spoke in French, which I don't really understand, so I think that's what they were saying. Or maybe they just told me to buy some cattle futures. Our November contest is underway still. Go to Bain.com, the front page there, for details on how to win a signed edition of Larry Correa's new big, fat, high-fantasy debut novel, Son of the Black Sword. Here's a hint. You send in your name for a random drawing to get that one. I think getting the hardcover of this one is worth it just for the cool four-color in-paper maps that come with the book. That isn't going to be in the trade paperback edition or the mass market paperback. The ebook edition has it, but it's... Um, just looks so neat on real paper. It's a beautiful little addition you get with the hardcover. Son of the Black Sword is available at booksellers everywhere, and Gentleman Joel and the Red Queen is available at Bain Books. This is part two of a two-part roundtable interview with David Weber and several top members of BU9, the Honorverse Consulting Group, talking about all things honor and beyond. Part one of the interview can be found in last week's podcast. I want to welcome several members of BU9, the David Weber Honorverse Consulting Group, to the podcast, and David Weber himself. Hello, folks. Hi. Hi. David Weber is the creator of the internationally best-selling Honor Harrington series and the Honorverse, within which that series is set. David's Honor Harrington science fiction novels have sold millions of copies over the years. David is also the author of many other novels, uh, many other Bain books, including the epic fantasy Bazel series, um, which is also Winwright. What are we calling this anyway? The... Um, well, I'm I'm calling them the Bazel cycle and the Ken Hoden cycle. All right. The latest is the Sword of the South, which is the first in the Ken Hoden cycle yes. of, of fantasies. David has had um, what are we, 28 New York Times bestsellers now, all told, and there are over 7.5 million David Weber books in print, which may be eight at the moment. Corinda sent me some new numbers. Uh, we have Thomas Pope, who is the founder of View 9, a collection of professionals assisting David Weber in defining and documenting the honorverse. 
In his first professional job for Bain, he served as a lead editor for House of Steel, The Honorverse Companion, which is a very cool book. Before founding View 9, he served as the co-designer of Ad Astra Games' Saganami Island Tactical Simulator, and as the co-author of both issues of Jane's Intelligence Review. Tom is also the co-author of new Manticore Ascendant series entry, A Call to Arms, along with David Weber and Timothy Zahn. Mark Guttis is a practicing attorney. Mark indexes and writes about the legal systems and governments of Honorverse within View 9. Chris Weave is a naval analyst working for the Department of Defense. He spent six years at the Center for Naval Analyses as a naval exercise analyst and war game designer, and five years on the faculty of the Naval War College as a war game designer and analyst. In addition to wargaming, his specialties include command and control and anti-submarine warfare. In the Honorverse, he's interested in command and control and naval tactical and operational doctrine. And Tom, can you tell us who the rest of our, our B9 folks are? Well, certainly. We have two, two other members. We have Arius Kaufman, who has been a member for quite a while, but he hasn't appeared on any of the podcasts before. Arius has been a, a he, what's it, human terrain? Was that the, the term yes, you used? Uh, he has uh, helped out with a lot of the government and the social structures of the Honorverse um, throughout uh, quite a bit of B9's history. And then our newest member, Stephen Ryder, um, he's a, been a member on probation for a couple of years, working on a couple of secret black projects, and now he is now a full member of BU9, working on the you economics. You, you of let it. him out of the closet. Yes, right? exactly. Is that what it is? Yeah, okay. <laughs> when I, I say secret black, I mean, just, <laughs> okay. yeah. You're just scratching um, sound on the inside <laughs> of the door. <laughs> and Stephen right now is working on the economics of the universe. That's probably a, a good cue for for me to introduce myself. Uh, I got involved with BU9 because at the first Onicon, uh, Andrew Presby was putting on a panel that was basically the civilian side of... By the way, I should say that and and Andy Presby will soon be known as Joel Presby's husband. (laughs) (laughs) Within the next few years, couple of years. Anyway, go on. Uh, Yeah, because Joel is working on the... or I think she's already finished her part of the third... Yes. The co-authoring book in the multiverse. Um, but going back to her husband, he was doing a panel on the civilian side of the universe. And at the time, I was working on MBA in finance, and probably for at least the last two decades, I've been trying to think about my own science fiction background. And with the MBA, and then trying to figure this stuff out, how does an economic system work across interstellar distance and with advanced technology and I wasn't having any success. It's like right on. These guys have figured out how it works. Sweet. I will go to (laughs) Greenville, South Carolina. I will take notes. It'll be awesome. And then the panel is basically, yeah, we know that we don't know these things. So after that, I had talked to um, Andy and I think by the time that I landed back in California, I'd written like seven or eight pages of stuff that I'd sent off to Tom. Um, and then another it w- one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and there's another piece of this too. I mean, Stephen and I have known each other for a while. Um, Stephen uh, was a frequent member of a mailing list called SF Consumel that I founded um, back in the mid 1990s. And I've oftentimes said that if um, if I had to write my epitaph for my tombstone, it would be founder SF Consumel, um, because of I think that that's actually had a huge influence on uh, certain parts of the science fiction community. Um, for instance, Ad Astra Games, in to some degree, is a is an outgrowth of SF Consumel. Um, Saganami Island Tactical Simulator came out of that. Bu Nine came out of that. Um, so I guess in some ways I'm the great great grandfather. Of BU9. Um, and so, Stephen, and so modest, too. Yeah, and so <laughs> modest. Um, on on and, BU9's mother's side. And, and it's really a shame that this is radio and you can't see how handsome I am. Um, but so, no, so, it's not. <laughs> yeah, I, I've, actually, I've actually been on TV before and I told the TV people, do you really want to do this? I've always thought that I had a face for radio. Um, but so, C- Stephen was a frequent poster on SF Consumel, so he was a known quantity from that standpoint. He's somebody that I had seen say smart things for pretty close to a decade before he ever uh, became involved in the Honorverse. And then you got to see what I really say when I'm saying more. <laughs> so how, 
does the monetary system work? Just say in the D- Star don't Kingdom. Go there. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't go there. David actually, there's a post, a couple of posts, I think, on some form where you talked about the monetary system. The monetary system is distinct from the economic system. So some of the stuff's already out there, and they talk about the details of the transactions and how banking works across interstellar distances. As for why you export freighter loads of corn from one planet to another planet and take several months to do so, we're not at liberty to say why that works. (laughs) This is one of the examples of places where we're really being very careful to make sure not not to break anything. Because it's a huge, complicated system, and it's something where we have 20, 20 books, 20 years of books that we have to match. And it's a system that, you know, if we take any of the models that, that Stephen has shown us um, and, and extrapolate them directly forward, it doesn't build that kind of system. And so it's something that it has, you know, there has to be a monetary system. There are people play poker for $5 ante. So there's got to be money. And we know there's money, and we know there's money in that amount. There's people who are making life choices based on income. So we know that it's not, you know, they're not post, they're not, it's not a, you know, it's not a post monetary society. And we know there's nanites, but we know that they're not, there's not gray goo, there's not like planets that just, you know, splooch, splorch out starships every few months, you know, magically from, you know, from their soup. So figuring out how to put that all together so we can have something that builds an economy that builds a, an economy that needs merchant ships to move around is a really difficult thing. And we're spending a lot of time doing that. And one of the reasons why Stephen was sort of hazed for two years is his probationary period is we gave him a rock drill saying, bring us an economy. And he <laughs> did. And we said, no, not that economy. Bring us another economy. <laughs> <laughs> and it also didn't help that the people that were that were reading the output of this, we were all really, really seriously busy at the time. Um, we all had day jobs that sort of spiked all at the same time. And so there were times where we just weren't able to give it the, um, the due diligence that we try to give everything that we do. I mean, I don't think there's a member of... There, there's, there's sort of, there's a core group of Buenine folks that are the people that are always available to sort of work on projects. There's some other people that sort of come in and work on things here and there, but they're of that core group of people. I don't think there's anybody involved that doesn't look upon it as their part-time job. Um, I mean, we take it. <laughs> Mark is raising his hand. Um, Mark is retired. <laughs> Mark is retired. So it's your full time job. Yeah. So we we look upon it as something that I mean we take it very seriously. Um, and now usually the way it works so for what a job. Do you, um, it, go psychologically, ahead. you wake up in the morning. You go. You, uh, do you go and check your email, see what the guys or and girls have come up with, um, and. We so you're going to work on it 38 minutes an hour. And we used to it's part of your day. Um, part of the problem we've run into is that we've we've gotten knocked off that schedule just because of the way the day jobs are working these days. Um, so what we do is we always try to carve off time. We have a we have a monthly Skype meeting of the what I refer to as the XCOM, the executive committee, which is all the officers and the board members, and that's where sort of the big picture project management sort of stuff happens. Tom and I have a weekly meeting where we talk about the companion and where we are and how things are getting done. Like uh, I drove Tom down. Tom was reading a submission from one of our other members about the, um, it was the Republic of Haven Marines. If the I Marines, correctly. yes. Yep. So he was reading through the, 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 um, um, the submission. It was about seven or nine, seven, eight, nine pages of text, something, something like, like that. I am. And so we were talking about the parts where we thought it it was right on the money. Uh, you know, by, we were looking at this going, wow, this is really good work. And it's from one of our newer members. We uh, So this is the first time we've really seen him put together like nine pages at a time. And we're looking at this going, this is really good. And there's this part here. We, we, we need to talk to him a little bit about this. We're not quite sure that he's got this right. But, you know, maybe he does. So maybe, you know, we need to ask him about that so that he can have a chance to convince us that that's the right answer there. So we we try to approach it like it's a professional endeavor. Um, and I've often said that I always say when I'm talking with Tony Weisskopf that that we're we really want to be viewed as being professionals and we try to treat it like professionals. 
Um, we're not just a club of guys that happen to get a book contract by accident. Um, we view this as we have not responsibilities. Not very many clubs get that. <laughs> no, not very many do. Because um, people don't want them. So we, yeah. we try to take it very seriously, and, and um, well, we try to take it very methodically. By, um, and we have reasonably high standards for ourselves. By training, um, I am a military and diplomatic historian. I don't know if that shows in the books, you know, you know, kind of thing. But while I have a hunch that I probably would not be a real comfortable fit on an awful lot of campuses these days in the history department, one of the things that I loved about graduate school was the fact that you had a bunch of folks who were interested in the same subject matter coming at it from different perspectives that you talked it through and you got insights and and, and that kind of thing and Bu9 does that in in a way there's I, I I use saying that it's a collegial atmosphere might perhaps give the wrong impression because that has this implication of sort of the magisterial kind of thing. But in the sense of being a confluence of people with deep shared interests, talking about the things that really interest them. It sounds like a think tank. Like a, you, could, you, could definitely, you could definitely call it yeah. that. I, for example, when I set up the the my my economic assumptions for the honorverse okay i basically didn't try to nail down you know how does the how does the uh, uh manufacturing sector work what are the processes involved i had some ideas about it uh but for example it didn't occur to me 25 years ago to have 3d printers and whatnot and i am now assuming that yes they have those kind of thing um, but you still have to assemble the components that you are 3D printing, you know, kind of in a mass production. And the other side of it was that I had created a form of interstellar transportation that meant you could move 2 million tons of something, uh, 6 million tons of something, for far lower transportation costs than had ever been available uh, on purely earthly distances. The, the, the painful analogy we use when we were talking about the economic system is that the, the, the transportation system with countergrav and the way starships work is you could economically move 4 million tons of dirt from one planet to another. We don't know if you need to, but you, yeah. but, you know, if you, if at this, at the price topsoil goes for, or, you know, just regular, you know, gravel, okay, if, you could, you could do that. If you look, I, I was doing this in, in the case of Montana in the Talbot quadrant yes, the other yes. day. Um, and it's like, okay, how much, how much beef does a typical American eat? And it winds out to be like over a ton a year that every, every American eats on average. That's when you get down to the two year olds. That's everybody. <laughs> that's the average. So then you say, okay, you've got 1800 planets. Okay. And you are assuming that most of them are going to have a standard of living at least equivalent to that of a 21st century American in the tech base that they've got. You could export as many million billion tons of beef, especially assuming that this beef is of superior quality and so forth from, from Montana as there's space on the planet to grow cows. Okay, I mean, that's the kind of scale and scope that you're talking about here. Um, and the freighters of, of uh, Travis's day are significantly smaller than the freighters of Honor's day. Okay, and so you're dealing with the period of, of um, okay, if you think of the time of Earth's final war, as sort of the equivalent of the age of exploration in yeah. terms of maritime history here on Earth. Okay, by the time you're up to uh, to Travis, uh, you're up to the emergence of the of Amsterdam, the Dutch Republic up there on the Baltic, and so forth. And by the time you get to Honors Day, you're to the point at which, at the height of the Victorian era, 
uh, uh, yeah. Great Britain has two thirds of the ship's two thirds of the world's tonnage kind of thing. But you're also seeing the growth in the size of the ships. By the time you actually get to honors time, you're up to the, the, the super, the super tankers and the huge container freighters and the quantities of freight that are being moved. And so I've never had a problem with the assumption that there are going to be goods to be traded in sufficient quantity between star systems, given the fairly the, the the very low cost of transportation to make interstellar commerce work and that if you have 1800 star systems just in the solarian league that have people living in them you're going to need a fair number of freighters just to move stuff around okay now that's what creates the problems for steve <laughs> okay <laughs> is that he's got to take that and say you know dave <laughs> <laughs> yeah but I mean that that those were the basic assumptions that went into and and you see one of the problems that I had was if I wanted to create these these interstellar political units there had to be some force to bind them together right. into interstellar yeah. political if all bonds. the planets were self sufficient you wouldn't need a lot of the things exactly we see. Yeah. and so the Solarian League grows out of an effort to regularize the the interstellar trade relationships that were already growing up. Uh, the, 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 the finance and credit banks of Antwerp or, or Venice when you're over in the Mediterranean earlier on have to be regularized on, on what hopefully is going to be an impartial basis for all of the star systems. And that's one reason the Solarian League government has all the problems that it has. It was never really envisioned as a government. It was visualized, visualized more as a trade association. And therefore, the mechanisms and in, the internal mechanisms involved in making it politically accountable are were extraordinarily underdeveloped or non-existent. Um, but see, that's kind of because I'm looking at it from the historian's perspective. Uh, to my mind, it makes no sense to structure a society that is. It exists at this moment, floating in eternity, severed from what became, what came before, or what's coming after. If you look at my series, all of them have this progression of the institutions, the technology, the whole nine yards, and it's the growth and the changes in those basic building blocks of the societies and the structures that I like to play with. Because the character growth comes out of dealing with those changing realities for me. In a, in a lot of ways. And so that's why when I, when I sat down, when I, when I, when I sat down to do the honor verse, Jim Bain had said to me, your books are all spawning sequels. Here's a thought. What about writing a serial deliberately from the beginning? <laughs> and I pitched 10 ideas to him. Uh, one of them became the honor verse. One of them was the multiverse. Uh, one of them was the Basel novels. Uh, one of them was the Safe Hold books being published by Tor. You know, all of these were ideas that I pitched to Jim Bain 25 years ago. And I didn't know that he'd been looking for someone to do Horatio Hor Hornblower in space for 20 years. And so he saw, you know, Honor Harrington as a six foot two inch Eurasian star shaped captain. He said, Ooh, 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 write him a contract. <laughs> no, write him two contracts. What? Make it four. You know, and at did, that point, David, in my did career, you just say that you haven't had a new idea in 25 years? No, I did not <laughs> say that. I okay, did not just, say that. Just, just making sure. Just making sure. Um, but the, the, um, the, the, to me, okay, but when I, before I did this, I sat down and wrote my original tech bike, which is about 80,000 words. Okay. Because I needed to build the universe before I started writing the stories. And that's just the way that I approach something. That's the tech Bible on the multiverse is bigger than, than the honorverse, uh, tech Bible. Um, it's not bigger than the honorverse tech Bible has become with the uh, additions and, and, uh, you know, amendments and, uh, expansion that it's undergone both from the books that I've written and from the, the stuff that BU9 has done. But I don't understand how you can write a novel without first conceptualizing the world in which that novel is set. And I think that's one reason why Bu9 is such a comfortable fit with me, because they are, they are expanding on something that to me is a fundamental, essential part of the storytelling. 
and that other writers, I think, sometimes just say, well, you know, the readers won't care about that. I think readers do care. I think that readers, some readers complain about my info dumps, okay, because I figure I'm going to give you the information you need, and then I'll go ahead and, and, and tell you the story. But I think that readers do have a sense of disquiet or less than total satisfaction when they're reading a book and that underpinning isn't there, even if they don't realize that's what's causing them to react that way. I, I do know readers that, that have told me that they just skip by the info dump. And yeah. to, to which my response is, that's great, because I'm there for the info dump. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't skip any of it. And um, that actually seems to me to be a really good um, way that we can both be happy. Mm -hmm. If you cut the info dumps out, I'm always looking for that background information. Yeah. I always want to know how that stuff works. Yeah, and the, if, the thing that, that after you really start reading David Weber books is that the info dumps have things you really need to know. He doesn't just dump stuff in. They're not weird digressions off into nowhere. No, I, it's, it's I not try not to anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The thing, <clears throat> David Weber makes uh, the job a little bit harder for himself because unlike, you know, somebody who's writing a Star Wars novel or a Star Trek novel, things change in the course <laughs> of uh, the Honor Harrington books. I think it was the second or third book, you introduced the Lax, and then you introduced the Missile Pods, and then Ghost Rider, and all these other different things that are changing fundamentally the way that warfare is done. And that makes it so something that was absolutely true in the first book now doesn't make any sense. And there, When you look at the pro progression of one starship versus one starship in Basil Station and, and uh, Honor of the Queen, moving up to fleets and fleets with, with hundreds of thousands of missiles in space at the same time it's just that the, the scope just has expanded so so radically uh that y you didn't notice topsy growing but topsy growed a whole lot well, yeah. I, the um i didn't realize that become a unit of measure yes. <laughs> some, somebody commenting on john's um um uh uh I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank because I turned 64 last week. Uh, um, 63. Um, see, I can't remember that. <laughs> uh, but um, his his Live Free or Die series, Thermopylae series. Somebody was talking about one of the battles and said, yes, they fired a Weber worth of missiles. And I thought, okay. <laughs> it's the collective yeah. now for missile yeah. groupings in yeah. space. Yep, yep. You know? yeah. cool. Well, what is... B9 working on right now. What is the cutting edge of B9? I'm hoping the next uh, companion is. So, Tony Weisskopf, we are working on the companion. We are working very, very hard on the next companion. Um, truth is, we are working on the companion. It's yeah. been going a little bit slower than we've wanted it to go um, because everybody's had a really bad case of life. Um, yeah. And the other thing is, is that, I mean, Tom and I and um, some of the other senior people that are really doing sort of the bulk of the heavy lifting on the companion um, had a conversation and we looked at it and went, you know, if we just put our nose to the grindstone and we're willing to lower our standards, we could get this done by Christmas. And we decided that we were unwilling to lower our standards to do it, that it, we'd rather turn in turn in something that met our standards than to try to, to rush it to meet um, a somewhat arbitrary deadline. So <clears throat> we've pushed back the delivery date for the for the next companion a little bit so that we've got a little bit more time to do it right. Um, the next companion is going to have the Republic of Haven and the, the Andermani Empire. And those are, especially the Andermani, is an area that is not as well fleshed out as mm -hmm. either the nations, star nations in the previous companion or the Havenites. And as a result, um, one of the things that's sort of been a long pull in the tent is that before we could write about the Andermani, decisions had to be made about the Andermani. Um, we needed to have a better understanding of what their history actually looked like. So Tom has been hard at work 
um, doing lots and lots of thinking about the Andermani and talking with David about the Andermani. And now incorporating Tim as well. This is this is an interesting yeah. ripple that we hadn't that seen going in. Yeah, yeah, because now we're you know we are writing right in that time period where the Andermani Empire has just become just been founded. They have that there will be you'll start to see more of them in the Travis books. And so we have to be very careful to make sure that we're building something that works for Tim's novels, that works for the history, and that we can then build out to what we mm -hmm. need for House of Lies. And so we build all that stuff together. We run it by our official German, Marcus. How do you know Wilmers? when you've gone deep enough? Do you know? Like you've opened the Russian doll and you've gotten <laughs> in well, so in terms of like the the core writing, we have House of Steel as which is our going to be our gold standard for. If we're writing the same, if we're covering, if we have the same coverage, we know we've gone deep enough for this for the book. Now that that coverage, if that is n, it's going to be n times two or three that we have to go deeper. So we know what's going on underneath it. And a lot of times it's just, you know, we have to, we have to, we have to pull the thread and sometimes when, that when, thread goes really deep. When you look at the material in House of Steel, you're seeing seriously maybe 10%, might be as much as 15, of the actual structure that's been erected under there. Um, the, um, and, and the fact that I'm going to be looking at we're looking at the same format with the original fiction in the front and the rest of it. And the story that I really want to do, and I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to pull it off, is to do two totally separated threats. One is going to be Thomas Theisman, one's going to be Eloise Pritchard from the moment that they begin to become politicized, if you will, and follow them in total separation up to the point where Eloise is summoned home by Thomas Theismann, and she doesn't know what's going to happen when she gets there. This is the guy who shot Oscar Saint-Just out of hand. She's been officially one of Oscar Saint-Just's fair-haired girls, you know, running this whole thing and whatnot. And and Javier Giscard and Lester Tourville are saying, well, we don't know him well, but we don't think that's what's going to happen. And she walks into the office and he stands up and says, I need you to be president. And she's like, say what? And he says, I have one condition, and that is the restoration of the Constitution and the political system that goes with it. If you'll do that, I will back you 100% with the military. Otherwise, I will remove you the same way I removed Oscar Saint-Just. And that's where the rebirth of the Republic really happens. And so where Roger was preparing to fight the wars, if you will, the, the Thomas and Eloise fiction will be how we fix the problems that led to the war, if you see what I'm saying. And I don't know that I'm going to be able to pull it off. I'm, you know, I'm, you I'm, just gave away the ending on a podcast. <laughs> he'll edit it out. He'll get to that part and he'll say, and she walks into the office and, and then he will say, and that was edited out because Chris pointed out, you know. Well, I think in this case it works because I mean, I, I think we're pretty sure that. Oh yeah, he doesn't sure. have her shot. Yeah, you um, know. There, there, this is actually, this scene is sort of reminiscent of how the, the story in the first, uh, companion came about that story came about when we were having a conversation around david's dining room table um uh about uh, what the story and the companion can look like and at the time there was another piece that never actually made it into that companion although we think that a version of it is going to be the anchor uh article like the building the navy and the honorverse article was the anchor article in the first one this was going to be the the three levels of war is our plan for the ankle anchor article in the second one and there was this the ankle marker the end yeah, yeah. Um, i'm the one with the braces okay you know <laughs> and there was this there was this plan to sort of tie in this article that was supposed to be written by roger winton with the roger winton story and david at that point goes yes and the story can be and he told us the outline of the story including the ending right off the top of his head and we all went wow that's that was a really cool moment um I think I actually wrote the letters to the to the proceedings. You wrote them that night. Well, you yeah, guys, you, yeah, you, we, yeah, yeah, we yeah, saw them Sunday morning. morning so. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and then we ended up not using the article that that sort of was the genesis for that. But 
We never throw anything away. Originally, it was written as Roger Winton had written an article to the Manticore Naval Proceedings um, talking about the implications for the future of a multi-month, multi, you know, a campaign type war, because in this time period, um, when Havenite was taking over other star nations, um, they were all very short, sharp wars. They were, it was really just invade the star system and you win. Um, and then there was mopping up. There wasn't anything that looked like a campaign. They were all the Austro-Prussian War, not the not the Franco-Prussian War, or or not World War II in the Pacific, yeah. right? Where you had island hopping campaigns and you had the sequence events, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So now I'm a graduate of the Naval War College. Um, the my co-author in this, the primary author in this, is a, a, one of our members named Pat Doyle. He's also a Naval War College graduate. This is what we teach in Newport. I was on the faculty there too. Um, and this is, uh, this is the sort of thing that we do. And so Pat and I both decided that it made sense to actually, <laughs> we're actually putting our Naval War College degrees to good use by <laughs> writing about how the operational level of war comes about in the honorverse. And so that's our, our plan is to, to turn that into the anchor essay in this next companion. That, that's also one of the great joys of working with BU-9 in that I, I would always have loved to be a writer, but I, I just don't have that, that creative ability to, to come up with plots and, and, and flesh them out. But what I can do is I can take something in the universe and write a law review article about it. Because I know how a law review article is structured, and I know the background that went into it, and it, 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 it enables me to be creative within the context of both the universe and my area of expertise. Um, Mark and I were both down in Orlando for a wedding. Was it last month? Or September. Month September. Okay, so it's still technically last month. <laughs> um, and we had uh, we had breakfast before they got on the road where they were going, and we got on the road back home. Sharon and I did. And we spent breakfast and probably an hour and a half At after least. Uh, talking about the the basis for maritime law, as it were, in the Solarian League and how that slotted into the the basic original structure of the Solarian League. And we were coming at it on two levels. One level was an understanding of what, call it admiralty law in the, in the honorverse is. The other one was, especially for me, was how do the basic assumptions of the system that Mark and I were talking about, how does that slide into the original organization of the Solarian League as this... Uh, in essence, an agency designed to oversee uh, interstellar commerce. Okay, and that's one of those areas where his expertise area slotted directly into a need that is fundamental to driving the 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 story in this created universe. And you've got to have a platform under there if it's going to be consistent, okay? Um, and that's one of those areas where, like, when when we did the article for the, the first companion uh, on, on structuring a Navy, okay, I actually had in my mind, in my, my underlying assumptions that I was writing from and so forth, almost everything that needed to go into that article, but I had never actually articulated it anywhere. I'd never actually written it down even for myself. So when Chris started asking the questions involved in putting that article together, it had this huge focusing effect on things. And it was kind of like when you've created a character and you really know that character well, you don't have to think about, well, how is that character going to react in this scene? You, you just say, okay, this is how that character reacted. It was kind of the same thing for me when Chris was asking his questions because I kicked the Royal Manticore and Navy around enough in my mind. I had enough 
underlying assumptions about why they did what they did, that when he asked me a question that directed my attention to that particular aspect to it, it was kind of like, oh, well, of course, this is the way that it works. But I never would have gotten to that point probably of, of, of specifically articulating it to myself or anyone else if Chris hadn't asked me the questions in the first place. One of the things that we're, I think we're pretty good at is we're good at providing a professional framework that they, David can then hang ideas on. Um, because we all either have a tremendous amount of study or we have day jobs or in a lot of cases professional study degrees in the sorts of things that we have conversations with David about. And so, I mean, I, I'm a naval analyst. I went in there I, uh, with, a, with a model on how exactly all the different pieces you need for a Navy um, because I, I, that's, what, that's what the day job was. Um, and so David was able to hang his ideas off of the real, real world things. When, when uh, Andy Presby and David and I have a conversation about what exactly happens in the combat information center of a ship in the honor verse, um, you know, Andy and I have both spent a lot of time in combat information centers. We know how they work, um, and we know how the honor verse works. And we can, and like at the the last honor con, um, David wasn't there for it. He had gone home and gone to sleep. But Andy and I ended up staying up until four o'clock in the morning, having a very in depth conversation about exactly how the C a CIC in the real world differs from a CIC in the honor verse. And it was really sort of funny because. Uh, Tom and some of the other members of U9 the next day were saying, wow, you and Andy were really going at it. You were really arguing. And Andy and I are going, that was an argument? That wasn't an argument. That was a passionate discussion <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> among professionals. <laughs> well, no, I, think, I think that also you get to the point where um, the distinction between argument and quarrel becomes important because these guys can have arguments in the sense of we are laying out our reasoning and this is where it comes from and they're for the most part completely satisfied that the end of the day is going to be a synthesis of more than one viewpoint more than one position on how this works and they both know that the other one really cares about the quality of it. I think they know that, and they also know the caliber of the person with whom they are having the discussion. I have never seen in any of the BU9 discussions anybody kind of rolling their eyes and going, well, yeah, that's just so-and-so, you know. I mean, there have been moments when we've kind of all gone, <laughs> you know, uh, over, over something or, or, or something. <laughs> but, but the, but the, the, the mutual respect is there. And I think that it helps carry a lot of the interaction that they do very effectively. Can we end it there then? Let me uh, yeah. do that. Um, We've probably run way over your yeah, time. This will be great. <laughs> well, let us, uh, let's call it a day here. We've been talking with David Weber and members of BU9, the Honorverse Consulting Group Extraordinaire. BU9 Associates, uh, thank you so much for being with us again. It's hey, wonderful to have you here. Tony, thank you, if Tony. I can add one last thing. We're in town because we're going to Honor Con, which is the uh, con put on by the Royal Manticore Navy. This is a con that BU9 actually started a couple of years ago, and we managed to, to convince somebody else, I mean, offered it to somebody else so that they can now run it. Um, thank God it's not us anymore, because running a con is really hard work. Um, they do this every week, uh, every year. <laughs> wow. <laughs> they do it every year um, at the end of October. They also have another con in Minneapolis called Manticon that they do Memorial Day weekend. Um, that's what brings us to town, and, and it's a, it's for Honor Harrington fans, it's a great opportunity for them, for people to go and hang out with a lot of other Honor Harrington And by the fans. time you hear this, that will have been last weekend. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> but make plans weekend, but... for next year now. Do we have any 2016, though? Is it going to be in Raleigh again? Or? Um, as far as I know, it's I, going to be I in Raleigh think, again. I think, I think Martin so. said that he has like a three-year, four-year so. uh, contractual relationship with the with the hotel. These are I wonderful events, doing. and I highly recommend them. I, I the the last one, the the one before last, I met somebody I had babysitted in high school who's now in charge of the uh, missile defense of Washington, D.C. You know, <laughs> and I had him write an article for the website. Because I well, it. I have to say, some years ago, I was at Dragon Con, 
I was guest writing and I'm autographing books of this. This college rising senior comes up to me and I'm signing his book and he says, Oh, Mr. Weber, you're my favorite science fiction writer in all the world. Well, this is good, you know. And then he says, You're my mother's favorite science fiction writer in all the world. And I said, That's pretty good too. And then he said the fatal words, she used to read me to sleep with your stories. <laughs> And I felt that knife go right up under the third rib and twist. <laughs> okay. But it, it occurred to me a while back, okay, um, I sold the first novel in 89. So I'm coming up all right on 30 years of, of doing this. And this is a little bit of a spoiler, but if we plan things properly, I will be tying up the Honor Harrington storyline, and in, in as I originally envisioned it, except without her dying, probably, um, in April of 2018. And if I pull that off, that means that the final volume in that cycle that started with Basilisk Station will come out exactly 25 years after the first one, which would be kind of cool. Um, but uh, on the other hand, I'm about two months behind on my writing schedule right now, so there could be a teeny tad of slippage in there, you know, never can tell. And there'll probably be another multiverse book in there somewhere, too, and that's, you know. So go for 30 years since the first book? Then? No, 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 no. If I go for 30 years since the first book, I may not be here for, the, <laughs> you know. That's I want to find out what happens to Ken Hoden also. So. Yeah, well, okay. I, I can tell you, but we'll have but to I go off them, yeah. So, Tony, do you want to try to end it again? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. We've been talking with David Weber, members of BU9, the Honorverse Consulting Group extraordinaire. Uh, thank you all very much for being with us. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. This portion of Under a Graveyard Sky is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at Audible.com now. If you are not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Now here is another segment of John Ringo's novel, of zombie infestation and the heroic humans who fight back, determined to pull the world from disaster and humanity itself from the brink of annihilation. It's all taking place under a graveyard sky. When Dad went, I was down in my cabin, Tina said, sipping tomato soup. She'd had a shower and her hair was combed. All three of the Smith women were larger than her, so the sweat she'd borrowed from Sophia made her look even tinier. I heard Mom screaming. Captain Charlie blocked the door and put some food and water in my cabin. Then he made all the locks and told me to lock myself in the cabin. He'd... He told Dad that was what he should do in the first place. All of us in different cabins with a way to make it hard to get in or out. Then he... He went. How long ago? Stacy asked. She'd geared up and gone over to check out the fair line after Sophia had taken charge of the survivor. After a bit and some toting of materials from the hunter, she'd managed to get the engines running. The boat still had nearly two-thirds of its fuel, and the water tanks were full up. The reason that Tina had run out of water was the batteries supplying the pumps had finally gone dead. I don't know, Tina said. There was a big storm. We got hit by it too, Sophia said. That was about a month ago. Then, about a month and a half, Tina said. I ran out of food after the storm sometime, and as long as the water lasted, I'd drink a bottle of water, then fill it. Then the water shut off, and I couldn't flush or anything, and... She curled up into a ball. I can't promise that nothing bad is ever going to happen again, Steve said, and I can't bring your parents back. But I promise I'll do my best. Okay? Okay, Tina said. She leaned into Sophia and tucked in her head. Hey, Faith said, standing up. Somebody should probably be on deck making sure we keep the boat in sight. I volunteer for watch. 
Go for it, Steve said. I'll be up in a bit. Don't mind her, Sophia said. She's good at fighting zombies. Not so big on the whole helping others thing. I guess you need people who are good at fighting zombies, Tina said. Can I ask, what did you do with my mom and dad? We gave them a decent burial at sea, Tina, Steve said. The best we could under the circumstances. Thank you, Tina said. There's something we need to talk about, Steve said. Now, Stacy asked. If not now, when, Steve said. It's about your parents' boat. This one is about done. The law of the sea, such as it is right now, is that if a boat is unoccupied, it's salvage. But you were on your boat, so it's yours by right. Not to mention it's got your name on it. But you need to use it, Tina said. If you can take me back to Virginia. Virginia's not there, Tina, Sophia said. I mean, the land's there, but it's all zombies. All? Tina said. I mean, all? We've been inshore a few times, Steve said. Everywhere we've been, there are zombies on land. No lights at night. No sign of civilization. Everything? Tina said, looking at Sophia for confirmation. New York? We sailed out of New York Harbor when they blew the bridges, Sophia said. We actually attended the last concert in New York. And there hangs a tale, Steve said. But the point is, we need your boat. You can have it, Tina said. I never want to see it again. And that won't work either, honey, Stacy said. After we get it cleaned up, we're all going to have to go back on board. Oh, Tina said. I'm not sure. I really don't want to go back. Cross that bridge when we come to it, Steve said. But we have your permission to use it? Yes, Tina said. I mean, I'll give it to you, just for getting me out of there. Probably ought to get that in writing, Steve said. But I'm not really worried about it. Is Washington still? Tina asked. Let me see if I can put this in perspective, Sophia said, getting up. She turned on the shortwave receiver and consulted a chart. Hear that static? That's the primary U.S. federal emergency channel, the one that FEMA used to broadcast on. This, she said, changing the channel. That's the BBC. This is ABC. CNN. Fox Radio. Oh my God, Tina said, her eyes wide. She started crying again. You survived, Tina, Steve said, taking her chin and making her look at him. You survived. And as a parent, I can tell you that it was more important to your parents that you survive than that they survive. You were important to them. So your job, from here on out, is to not only survive, but to do the best you can at it. Understand? Yes, sir, Tina said. As I said, Steve said, standing up, it's not going to be easy, but we are not only going to survive, we are going to win. That's the first time I've heard you use the word win, Stacy said. She'd brought him a cup of coffee. That was one thing they'd taken off the yacht first off. They'd been out for two weeks. Penny for your thoughts? I'm not sure I have any, Steve said, looking at the other boat. But so far, all we've been doing is running and hiding. That was the right thing to do. Now? I'm not so sure. My basic plan was to find an abandoned island somewhere and set up shop. Maybe there's a house somewhere with a harbor or something. Seeing Tina. Honey, he said, taking the coffee and setting it down. He turned to her and shrugged. There are people out there, just like Tina, hiding in compartments, starving, dying of dehydration. On life rafts. We've been avoiding them for fear of someone going zombie, but by now, most of them will have gone through the cycles. If they haven't, we've still got some of Tom's vaccine. We can save people. Are you sure that's a good idea? Stacy said. I mean, Stephen, there's only four of us. 
We are not exactly the Coast Guard. Just tying up to Tina's boat was tough. Compared to, say, going to a concert in New York in a zombie apocalypse at night, Steve asked. You're never going to let that go, are you? Stacy said, with a breathless laugh. Zombies don't think, Steve said, but whoever created that virus does, and I bet they had a plan to survive. I bet they're out there. And that person thinks humanity is beaten. There's no indication that anyone is doing anything. Everything is gone. There's no government, no army, no navy, no coast guard, no homeland security. No homeland, for that matter. It's all gone. The bastard won. Well, I'm not going to be beaten. I'm not going to have my children and my grandchildren grow up hiding from the zombies. I'm not going to let that happen. I will not bow to the zombies. Do you have a plan? Stacy said. I have an inkling, Steve said. I have a goal. I have the goal of a zombie-free world. I don't know if I'll see it in my lifetime, but I'll start with the US and that's going to have to be good enough. Big plan, Stacy said, shaking her head. Steve, I love you for your paladin side, but saving the world is usually a metaphor. If not us, who? Steve asked. Tom, if he's out there still, is locked into a fortress and can't get out. Ditto any remaining government groups. There probably are government-secure points that held out, but they're trapped by the zombies. We have mobility. And there are other boats, ships, survivors out there. We'll rescue them and organize. You think they'll go for it? Stacy asked. Tina's a lovely child, but she's not going to be much help. They're all going to be traumatized, terrified. Some will, Steve said. Those that don't, he shrugged. Cross that bridge when we come to it. We'll cross every bridge when we come to it. We're going to win, and I'm not going to let the bloody damn zombies stop us. I will not bow. That was another segment in our complete audiobook serialization of Under a Graveyard Sky by John Ringo. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a scratchy phone call from Uptime with the secret details of mixing a faster-than-light margarita that gets you tipsy 15 minutes before you actually drink it, along with the thanks of a grateful galaxy for brightening up and tending to this corner of the Milky Way to David Weber and the Bunine Honorverse Consulting Group. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. And keep reaching for the stars. The Bain Free Radio Hour is brought to you by Bain Books Audio Drama. Presenting dramatized audio plays of the best science fiction and fantasy with a professional cast and cinema quality soundtracks. Now available, Eric Flint's Islands, based on the novella by Eric Flint. Also available, Larry Correa's Detroit Christmas, based on the novella by Larry Correa, set in the world of the Grim Noir Chronicles at BainEbooks.com. Just put Islands and Detroit Christmas in the search bar and enter a world of listening pleasure. Bain Books Audio Drama. Thank you.